Today's conversation is with Jane Caro. Jane is the first person I've spoken to who has absolutely and completely leaned into aging. I can't prepare you enough for how beautifully she speaks about where she is in this journey. I don't know that I'll ever get there, but she is so inspiring and I so hope to follow in her footsteps. You're just gonna love her. Hey baby, it's time for the Nikki Alpert Podcast. Come on, pull up a chair. We gonna have some fun. <laughs> Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. Today, my very special guest is member of the Order of Australia and Walkley Award winner, Jane Caro. Jane is a writer, she's a novelist, and she's a very feisty social commentator. <laughs> is that okay that I called you feisty? <laughs> Absolutely. I think you are very feisty. Absolutely. I came, incredibly. I came across you, Jane, on your TED Talk and growing old, the unbearable lightness of aging. And boy, I, I just, I have a crush on you, woman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I don't get many of those these days, so I'm very pleased. <laughs> I am so into you, I can't even stand it. <laughs> Honestly, your your commitment to speaking up with such confidence and such a sense of humor is so moving and so engaging for women in general, I'm sure. I, I'm, I'm guessing some men don't love it so much, but who cares? Clearly you don't, and I yeah. love that about you. No, I don't care. Uh, no, women spend far too much time worrying about what men think of them. There you go, that is true. And also what other women think of them, which I think is very paramount to us. But at some point, like you like to point out, when you get older, you start to care a lot less about what anybody thinks. Absolutely. The great, the lightness of aging, as I called that TED Talk, really is the ability to occupy your own self more fully than you ever have before. And a lot of that has to do with giving up the idea that you will be universally approved of and that somehow you can improve yourself to such an extent that suddenly everyone will realize what a fabulous person you are. That's just nonsense. You will never be universally approved of. And if you were, you'd be playing a part. They wouldn't be approving of you, the real genuine you. They'd be approving of some mask you've manufactured. And what's the point of that? It's exhausting. It's dishonest. And it actually doesn't say anything particularly good about you or them. Well, we see a lot of that, you know, social media now. I mean, that whatever people think they follow and think they love is just the mask that they're wearing, which is such an important thing to realize that at some point you just have to give that up. But I, I just love that you have come to a place. So I'm not there yet. There's a lot of me that is where you speak of. And I, I have reached the point where I know that my opinions matter. And if they don't matter to you, it matters to me. And that's all that matters. And mm, yeah. that, right, that gives me great strength. But I am still struggling with, and I, I have stalked you a little bit online. And so I've seen a lot of what you've said to people about a lot of different things. And you mentioned that thing where you look in the mirror and like you, you feel... 14 or 39, you look at the mirror, you're like, who is that old codger staring back at me? It's so weird. <laughs> like, how does that happen? So, but your, and your sense of humor about it is the only way to get through it, I think, you know? Uh, yeah. But you're so sold There's on, another way. Tell me. Um, well, it's just interesting because I knew this conversation was coming up and um, we were driving somewhere and I could see myself, you know, I'm the passenger seat, I could see myself in the rear vision mirror and I was noticing um, little signs of ageing on my face, my um, jowls dropping down, a line that's developing like, you know, the puppet uh, lines on the chin and that kind of thing. And I found myself, and I was really pleased about this, I found myself not feeling bad or disgusted or repelled or upset, but actually thinking, how interesting. Look what's happening to my face. Look at how it's changing. Look at how the contours of my life are carving themselves onto the face that I carry out into the world. And I can honestly 
hand on heart say that I didn't feel, I'm not going to be stupid and say I was celebrating and it was great. No, but nor did I feel remotely upset about it. It was an observation. I observed it and it was perfectly fine. Well, the way you observed it was better than perfectly fine. The contours of your life have you know, made themselves obvious on your face. That is so true. And I, I do have moments like that, especially, by the way, mm. when I listen to you speak about everything. Because <laughs> uh, honestly, because I honestly feel like, Jane, when I hear you talk about whether you're talking about one controversial subject or another, your belief and your confidence in it makes me it ignites my confidence. And I don't think you could understand, like I don't think my 22 year old daughter would understand it from the same place that I can because I am your contemporary. I, yeah. I don't think, she, right? Yeah, I think it's, look, I, I've honestly, as I look back over my own life, I have a theory that to be young is to be insecure because you are untried, because and our children perhaps are particularly insecure because we've protected them so much. So much. And they've lived such um, safe, safe lives. And on some level, they know that. And so they know that when they go out into the world, they don't know how strong they actually are. And the one, another lightness of ageing, I think, not necessarily for everybody, but for many of us, is that we have learned how strong we are. And the thing I realised about myself is that I was thousands of times stronger than I ever actually believed I was. Now, that's not because I'm particularly strong. That's not the truth of it at all. But in fact, that all of it, um, we, we're, we're, we evolved to cope with crisis and difficulty and tragedy and all those things. The human race wouldn't have gotten this far without that ability that's all of us we all have that strength mm -hmm. within us but when you're young you I, I spent my life when I was young comparing myself to everybody else that's I, and I now believe I thought at the time it was unique to me but now I believe no that is what young people do and they have young to women trying to work out and young women but I think young men do it too yeah young men but the tragedy I think for men in our society is how hard it is for so many of them to ever speak honestly about their own internal monologue and the voices in their own head. Very true. They have to pretend. Our, our, our conception of masculinity is such a toxic one because we really see it as, as perfect. Mm -hmm. we really, a man has to be perfect. He can have no weaknesses. He can have no vulnerabilities. He must always be strong. He must be, always be in charge. He must always be in control. Well, no human being. No human being can live that up to that. And men are just human beings. That's right. um, so it's terribly lonely for them because women have a huge advantage in that we connect by communicating our weaknesses, our vulnerabilities and the things we had hard to deal with. And then we get close to one another because that's who we really are. We're all our weakest bit, not our strongest bit. And men who must pretend they don't have any weak bits live mm -hmm. I think, and obviously I'm observing from the outside, I'm not a man, but from observing from the outside, I think many men live profoundly lonely lives because they never tell anyone the truth about who they are. That mask is much more impenetrable for blokes, I think, a lot of the time than it is for women. Because um, how you feel is who I think you are. That aging's harder for them. Yes. Yeah. And well, and and what you stumble over and what you learn from and, and what you believe and, and your ability to admit that you were wrong, your ability. One of the reasons that I'm prepared to get out there and say controversial things is I don't think I have to be 100% right all the time or I'm a disaster. If somebody gives me a good reasoned argument as to why my perspective is incorrect or flawed, I don't see anything wrong with saying, oh, that makes sense. I must go away and think about that more. Thank Why you very much. Why is that regarded as a yeah. disaster? Right. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Because the hope but is, as you get older, that you continue to learn, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, I've never learned so much in my life as now that I'm older. And I think that's because I've taken my focus less on my obsessing about me and what other people think about me and more, much more interested in 
what's going on out there and you know how are we all dealing with let's be frank the mess we currently find ourselves in mm -hmm. uh, it's an externalized viewpoint where you learn a lot more than when you constantly and it's look um self-examination is a really important thing to do and i do it all the time but constantly obsessing over how you're not good enough is just a waste of time and energy of course you're not good enough and you're also completely good enough you know both of those things are true again you're not perfect that doesn't mean you're not good enough the way you speak is so true of course you're not good enough and you are good enough i mean and and also the idea that when you're younger you always think you're right and as you get older is when you realize well maybe i'm not always right and if you don't realize that well then you're just screwed you spend your whole life alone because nobody can stand you <laughs> i feel like the part of me that accepts and loves the aging part is all that's happened internally, all that I've learned, all that I've gotten through, like you said, you know, the death of my parents, the loss of loved ones, things like that, that I realized, oh, I guess you can carry on when you just think you're going to lay down and die. And you realize you're much stronger than you think you are. And again, like you said, life teaches us that. Experience teaches us that. And you can't get that if you're not lucky enough to get older. Yeah. That's right, if you're not lucky enough to get older. And, and that's something that, you know, you forget when you're beating yourself up for having jowls or as you call them marionette lines, we call them nasal labial folds and that just sounds so horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to use that, <laughs> nasal labial folds. I've got, that's what I've they call it in America. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah. it's the inside of me is grateful for all that I've learned and where I've come to. But the aging process, the thinking about getting my face done, the, you know, the menopausal change, the fear of that. And to hear you talk about all the great things about the physicality and this, the freedom that's given you and <sighs> the acceptance of it all, please tell my friends what we're talking about here. <laughs> Look, I am here to tell you all because I am on the far side of menopause. Um, I think I went through menopause 12 years ago at the average age of 52. That's when most women actually go through menopause. That's right. um, now, perimenopause was hell on wheels. I have to say it was hell on wheels. I hated perimenopause. Menopause itself is a, a period of time you don't even notice because in fact, you don't know you've been through it um for quite a long time because it is the cessation of periods and anyone who's been through perimenopause would know you think they've ceased and then they come back and <laughs> bite you with a vengeance at the most inauspicious times and very yeah. unpredictably on your so white pants after labor to... day <laughs> that's right exactly oh now i can wear white pants every day of the week and i do um <laughs> you know and then you get through menopause and you suddenly realize my god i have and had a period for a very long time i think i must be through the other side and so many wonderful things happen when you're on the sunny uplands of postmenopause. the first which i talk about in my ted talk at the very beginning and is important to me because i'm quite a small woman but i have big boobs and um all my bloody life since i was 10 years old and you know you get the buds developing when you're just starting to get boobs and I remember sitting at the school desk and bumping my chest and thinking, ow, what oh, the yeah. hell's going on there? <laughs> and the pain of your nipples while your breasts develop. And then every period, like the, the month, for two weeks, my boobs would hurt like hell and swell <laughs> up and hurt like hell. And, I mean, I couldn't jog. You've got to no. be kidding. I mean, that was <laughs> agony. Um, I've never understood why women want to get boob jobs honestly unless it's to reduce the size i found them to be nothing but a bloody burden and a, and literally a pain and um they would they hurt for what 25 30 years now <laughs> nothing not a peep i can jog I was silly enough to want a jog um and i can you know i can as i say in the ted talk i can go over the bumpiest pothole roll road without wincing um <clears throat> no pain none <laughs> and your body does that for women this is why i say women is actually easier for, uh, aging is actually easier for women than it is for men um, regardless of the myth and what the commercial entities want you to believe our bodies improve our bodies improve 
we don't get periods anymore. I'm sorry, can you explain <laughs> the downside of that? Because I haven't found one. Uh, we can have sex without worrying about getting pregnant. We don't have to use contraception. Yeah. We don't have to sit white knuckled on the toilet when our period's due and hope like hell that that contraception actually worked and that right. we're not going to have to make some difficult decisions about our lives, which are now getting more and more difficult because the That's absolute right. nut jobs, the religious nut jobs are taking over. I mean, I'm horrified about what has happened in Texas. I can't believe it. I'm proud to say in Australia, in the last two years, every single state in Australia has decriminalised abortion. Thank um, God. We're... Uh, I know, I know. We're ahead in some things, not in others. Um, but anyway, all that goes, all that worry goes. We're stopping a life support system for another human being. And you can re, really, in a way, reoccupy your own body in a way you haven't felt since you were nine or ten years old. <laughs> it's wonderful. So and you're saying you feel yes. younger. Yeah, you feel younger on the other side of menopause. Yes. <laughs> you feel younger on the other side of menopause because you're not going through that hormonal cycle, yeah. which is so tyrannical for women for so long. We cope with it. We deal with it brilliantly. But the relief when it goes is real. At least it was for me. But the, the other side of it is, yes, you get aches and pains and all those things because that's inevitable as you get older your joints and things have done a lot of work and they start to tell you about it but they start to tell you about, about it is, <laughs> and men are horrified because their body has been so much under their control for so long for all of their lives until they start to get older and then for the first time their body starts to let them down and that really sets them back on their ass but for women we're used <laughs> to having a body that's out of control that's easy stuff and in fact it actually improves as we get older our experience of our bodies improves i'm here to tell you sex gets better just do your pelvic floor exercises that's absolutely important. but for sex and for enjoyment of sex and um so all those things are just an upside for us and also um as our exterior, our face and our figure gets less, you know, conventionally attractive, what the mm -hmm. world approves of, our insides become so much stronger, more realistic, less vulnerable to um, other people's opinions, as we were saying before, but also less vulnerable to our own self-criticism. We're, in a way, the beauty of loss of beauty is you lower your expectations. You stop expecting to attract all eyes as you walk into a room, to be, you know, the sort of gorgeous thing that everyone admires. You stop expecting that of yourself. And that is also liberation because for a very long time, I've believed that happiness is the management of expectations. Um, if you have very high expectations, you're likely to have very little joy in your life. If you if you have realistic expectations and old age teaches you, you better have realistic expectations because your body is going to pull you up short if you don't. That's true. You find you get a lot happier. In fact, there's a bell curve about happiness that shows that older people, contrary to what younger people think they should be, are actually pretty bloody happy. It's funny that you talk about ex your expectations because, you know, anytime I complain to my husband about it, he's always like, he always says to me, Nikki, be happy with how everything looks right now because it's only going to get worse. <laughs> this is the Getting best worse. you're ever going to look. <laughs> and I'm always like, oh. yeah. but he, he is right. And as you said, your connection to everything else, I think because when you let go of your connection to the outside, you become so much more deeply connected to the inside, which allows you to find yeah. the strength in your, the courage of your conviction, how you feel in the bedroom, how connected you are to your femininity and all of that stuff. And you know, I also saw you talking about, and I don't want to get off on a riff on this because I think this is more important to women, mm. but I, I did hear you say how, you know, men don't not get stuff because they're not handsome or beautiful. And they don't get, they're not invisible because of any of the physicality of it all. But later as they age, then they're too old for something. And it's the first time they become part of a negative group. And if just there, elaborate on yeah, that. If there, yeah, if they're a white, straight, middle class, particularly man, 
in this society. They have no experience of what it is to be a member of what I call a group. They are the norm against which all other human beings are measured. And they don't know that, not, not viscerally. Some of the really smart ones might kind of understand it intellectually, but viscerally that doesn't really mean anything to them. But as they get old, they stop being the norm against which every other group is measured and they become a group themselves. The way you can tell is so simple. I don't know if you do it in America, but in Australia, we are very scathing of different groups of drivers. So for example, there's a lot of women driver kind of insults. Uh, we have a lot of Asian Australians and a lot of people are extremely racist, uh, but also uh, they say, oh, Asian driver. You know, there's this dismissal of people as being not an individual, not a fully fledged whole human being, but a member of a group, a representative of a group, all of whom are pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. No one ever says, oh, man driver. That just, you don't hear it. <laughs> But you do hold here, oh, bloody old codger driver, useless old driver. You do hear that. You do. Um, and that is when men, old men, for the first time, if they're white and straight, in particular middle class, start to experience what women, people of colour, LGBTQI people have experienced their whole life mm. of being reduced to a group. from your rich and individual self to representative of an amorphous group all of whom are a bit shit old men get that for the first time old welcome women. to the oh, club sir <laughs> yeah exactly it's no difference to us we're used no, to it seriously so in your ted talk you also talk about the uh the leering the unwanted leering not just of men but of women too but I want to talk about that because it's one thing to wish for the attention from everybody. But, you know, if you're a woman, whether you're black, white, green, or purple, you've had unwanted leering and unwanted dick pics and all that stuff. So it's some people call it invisible. Too old dick pics, thank God. <laughs> you're not too old for it. I mean, come on, imagine what Never you could be getting. <laughs> Well, if I had one, Never I would send one. you one. If I had I one, I... young. <laughs> if I had one, I would send I you one right one. now. <laughs> I know what they are because I've got pretty daughters. But I'm, I'm, when I was young and juicy, uh, the internet didn't ex exist, and so there was no such thing. Um, yeah, men would expose themselves to you on the street. That was always. Uh, <laughs> completely ridiculous i used to look at the thing you're just sad um nobody's interested in that mate um and um then i got too old so hey born at the right time absolutely I, I i've never gotten one either and i am glad about that i have over the years standing behind people doing their hair seen my clients with you know turn to something and i'm like oh my god oh my god <laughs> so i have seen them just not sent to me so i think i'm also a little late on the spectrum for that uh, I'll probably get one tonight for my husband if he's hearing me talk about this. And I hope you, I hope you do too, by the way. <laughs> so talk to me more about what you said on your, on, on your TED Talk. I mean, you talked about the, the lack of, uh, well, talk to me actually, like what I just said, about how nice it is not to have that horrible leering or comparing yourself to the other women in the room for what to they not, think. To not... Yeah, it's it's all it's connected to this no longer caring what people think. You no longer walk into a room or a party or whatever and expect everyone to look at you. You, you know they're not going to. Um, and that stops being an issue. Again, your expectations have changed. You no longer expect that to happen. It doesn't happen. It doesn't worry you. Um, what I'm looking for when I walk into a gathering of some kind, and we're in lockdown over here, so it's been a long Long time geez i'm looking forward to going back out there okay. but when i walk into a gathering of some kind i'm looking for someone i know someone i'm interested in someone i can have a really interesting conversation with um, mind you after i've got a drink uh, that's <laughs> the next thing i'm looking for the first thing i'm looking for is a drink and the second thing i'm looking for is someone to have a chat with um <laughs> but that's really it and i'm not looking i'm not looking to pick up i'm not looking 
to be picked up. I'm not looking to be admired. I'm not looking to be Scarlett O'Hara at the barbecue surrounded by admiring young men. None of those things, if that happened, I'd find it icky and horrible and I feel like I was being mocked probably. So again, it's this comfort in your own skin where what you're looking for is what is going to feed your brain, not your vanity. Um, And I think one of the great lessons of ageing is in fact, letting go of vanity of this idea that it's not just important to be pleasing uh, physically to others but you want to look in the mirror and feel pleased with yourself now i don't want to look in the mirror and think i look shit i'm i like to have my hair nicely done i like to wear nice clothes but i'm much more interested in achieving elegance than looking young i really don't mind that I look my age I'm 64 okay fine aren't I lucky I've had friends who didn't make it to 64 right and it was Amy Poehler who said the smartest thing about that when she said stop complaining about getting old there are an awful lot of dead people who really wish they were still alive and I think that's exactly right aging is in a way a sign of triumph It is a sign that you have survived. And when I said, you know, the wrinkles and things are the contours of your life carved onto your face, they're also the physical expression of what you have survived, the marks of all those battles that you have found your way through. And that's so much more important than looking young and juicy Um, and also infantile, our association particularly for young women is a kind of uh, with beauty is a kind of bambi like face uh, Mm. with no marks of life upon it as if all young women need to be handed to whoever it is who desires them but particularly men clean uh, and totally untouched and unscathed and without any experience or wisdom or any personality even formed by living through life And so I think there's something about our obsession with beauty, which is profoundly sexist and profoundly controlling and profoundly afraid of the wisdom, strength, intelligence and experience of women. I I would agree with that 100 percent. And when you talk about looking in the mirror and not wanting to look shit, (laughs) I get that, too. But the elegance of it all, because you can't be so elegant at 22. I mean... You can, you can dress elegantly, but you, you don't have enough life experience and knowledge to be elegant, I think. And, right? Yeah. And, well, I think, too, you tend to look like you're dressing too old if you dress elegant. Mm-hmm. It's, it's quite interesting. It, it looks like you're sort of aping um, your mother or your grandmother. So let me ask you this. Do you think if you were not happily married, do you think you'd be as comfortable aging physically if you didn't have your husband of so many years who loves you who who thinks you're still sexy and even sexier and sees you like he did when he met you and today do you think that helps with your comfort level of getting through this part of our life i think that's a very very good question and i think the answer honestly has to be yes of course it does yeah um i mean one of the reasons that um being lucky enough to find a partner who grows with you and to whom you can remain attached for. I mean, Ralph and I have been together for 46 years. Not all of them, you know, (laughs) hunky-dory romantic moments of triumph. There have been some really difficult times too. It's a realistic human relationship. But nevertheless, we've been very fortunate in that we've managed to grow closer rather than further apart. And by the way, I would never advise anyone to stay in a lousy relationship. If you're in a lousy relationship, you've got one life, get out and go and get out and you're better on your own than with someone you're miserable with Mm -hmm. but I think it's true if you're lucky enough to find that kind of partnership it helps in every way and that's why people want it because it is much easier to be two against the world than one against the world of course his support the fact that he's always been in my corner gives me enormous courage and um, you know a sense of confidence that even if I, you know, stuff up spectacularly, and it happens, he will find a way to reframe it so that it's 
fine, not as bad as I thought, will pass, you know, all that kind of thing. One of the pieces of advice I do give young women, should they ever be foolish enough to ask me for any, um, <laughs> is, is your current partner in your corner? Does he make you feel better about yourself? Does he take or she take what has happened to you and reframe it so that you feel better after your conversation with them rather than worse? If your partner undermines you, makes you feel worse, um, always takes the side of those who are criticising you, pack your bags and go. That is not someone you want to spend the rest of your life with. Too many women live with people who constantly cut them off at the knees and make them feel worse about themselves. I don't understand why. We do it because we saw our fathers do it to our mothers. Mm -hmm. It's a model we've watched. I was lucky. My father, none of this, by the way, have I earned. None of this do I deserve congratulations for. I was lucky to be born to two very intelligent, big-hearted people not perfect, lots of flaws, but one of the greatest gifts I got was that my father adored my mother, adores her to this day, thinks she's the best person in the world and also thinks she's the smartest person he's ever met in his life. That, that gift to his daughters of that kind of respect for their mother is incalculable. And there's a really odd saying by Anonymous, and we all know that Anonymous was a woman, um, by Anonymous, that famous um, wise person or persons, um, which I've always loved, which says the best thing a man can do for his children is love their mother. And I think that is absolutely right. For sons and daughters, not just their daughters. Because for sons and daughters. That's right. I can only speak from my own experience as a daughter, but yes, for sons and daughters, because the mother is the most important person in a child's life. So if the father loves the mother as well as the children, obviously, right. that creates a sense of security and safety second to none. I had that. That is, as I say, that is the kind of rocket fuel for being a feisty social commentator that you need. Yeah, and also I think that when you are, when you're lucky enough to understand that that's the kind of love that is more beneficial, and a good thing, and you find a partner like that, it makes you feel beautiful, whether you're 22 or 82. And Ooh, so beauty- makes you feel attractive. You've attracted someone to you and they've remained attracted. In the end, beauty, I don't even know what beauty is. I, I, you know, I know there's an actual mathematical formula for it. Right, yeah, perfect face but with I, perfect vision, perfect yeah. equal. But I, when I said beauty, I meant like, you are beautiful, not what you look like. Like if somebody appreciates yeah, okay. how you think and how you behave and supports you, even when somebody else is coming down on you and explains that they understand why you felt that way and has your back. It has your back, yeah. That love makes you feel like a beautiful human being, not a beautiful statue. And yeah. Right? Yeah, so, I, I, I agree with that. I think the important part of that is human being because I'm always wary of, see, the things that I like best about myself, the things that I have gotten me the furthest, I think, have not been the bits of me that are the most uh, beautiful or um, um, I'm trying to, easy. Right. It, it, the bits of me that have gotten me the furthest and that I like the best about myself, that form the bedrock of my um, view of myself and life as being largely absurd, which forms my humour. Yeah. It is my sense of my weaknesses, of my flaws and my foibles and my, um, I, am, I, am, I am pushy, I am outspoken, I want to have my opinion, I want to get in there. And when I was young, I castigated myself for that. You know, don't talk so much, don't argue with people. You know, every gathering I go to, I'd end up in some sort of political argument with someone and I'd feel terrible afterwards. I think, you know, people don't like you because you're too abrasive and you put your opinions out there. But I couldn't cure myself of it. And thank God. <laughs> thank God, thank I was going to say. And that so, was the best bit of me. It, it always is to speak your mind and to believe in what you say mm -hmm. and to invite people into the corner where it's all okay to feel that way and be that way, which again is incredibly female. It's not very masculine to do that. But I think that, do you have birds? 
<laughs> no, we're out in the middle of the wilds of the Upper Allen in um, uh, the Upper Hunter in New South Wales in Australia um, on a 300-acre cattle property, and there are birds everywhere. Um, I can and hear I've them. The <laughs> door open because it's quite warm, so it's you beautiful. are hearing a Australian native birds flying around out there. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so yeah, so I think there's that. But I wonder, like, if you weren't married. If I weren't married, I'm very I'm comfortable with the aging process. I am I am considering having my lower face done. I do even when I'm home during the pandemic, going to my garage to work out and making dinner for my family. I like to put mascara on and earrings on, much like you. You like to have your hair done. It's not for anybody. It's for me. And but I do think about you know this is driving me crazy and. I want to get it done. I'm terrified to do it. And I would love to say, yeah, I see it. And you know what? I don't give a damn, but I'm not there yet. So give me another yeah. piece of advice that says, get there, Nikki. How would you, if I was your daughter, what would you say to me? Well, I gotta say it'll hurt. Is it worth <laughs> it? I, I hate pain. Um, it'll cost. Is it worth it? I hate spending money. Uh, um, well, I don't. I love spending money, but not on stuff like that. And right. also, every girlfriend I've had who's had a little thing like that done, mm -hmm. you can't tell. And uh, very soon afterwards, it goes back to the way it was, and you have to keep doing it. That is the problem with um, cosmetic surgery that they don't actually tell you about. You have to keep doing it. And I worry that if you do it, and look, it's your body, your face, you do what you want, but... I worry that once you start doing it, you're actually retarding the process whereby you can learn to become more comfortable in your own skin because you are putting off that time when you are going to have to look at your face in the mirror, catch sight of it in a, you know, plate glass window, whatever, and accept that you are no longer the girl you once were. And thank goodness for that. You are actually the woman that you were always meant to become and that everything you have done and every decision you have taken, good or bad, has led you to this place with this face and this body. And you're retarding that natural process because aging is a natural part of life. And I actually believe that it is about learning to let go. And by wanting to do this, you're hanging on. Mm -hmm. So you're not letting go it sounds scary but once you do it it's actually the opposite of scary um and i think we need to let go of things because the inevitable end of life there is only one way off this planet unless you're jeff bezos um and that is <laughs> to die that is it that is the only way off the planet and that's the end of life and aging is a natural way to say to you Enjoy this process, enjoy still being alive and compass mentis and energetic and experiencing things and no longer being afraid and no longer being insecure and no longer caring about other, what other people think because it's the last chance you've got because it's going to be over soon. I do think that letting go is actually the lesson of our lives, that that is what our lives are all about, to learn to let go and not hang on and try to stay in control because another thing about doing this you're trying to control what happens to you control controlling the uncontrollable creates anxiety oh, tell me about what, it <laughs> yeah exactly i had an anxiety neurosis for 12 years when i was a young woman um and i only learned how to overcome it and you know look i have overcome it to such an extent that some people may say I've overcorrected. Uh, but <laughs> the way I have learned to overcome it was to realise the difference between what I could control and what I couldn't and not to spend any energy at all on the stuff I couldn't control, which stopped me, helped me rid myself of fear of flying because I'd say to myself, no, you can't think the plane in the sky and you can't think the plane out of the sky you haven't got that kind of power that's right the pilot is flying the plane leave the job to her or him sit in your chair drink the free wine eat the free food and enjoy <laughs> the movie and that's what i do and um it, it, control is actually it feels desirable but i think it fucks us up 
the seeking of it sure does, because like you said, you, you never have it. I mean, and if, and if, and I've said this a billion times in the last year, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that, right? And yeah. it seems yeah. to me that when you go to these people who try to tell you what life is about, there's always the reminder to be present. Mm. But the idea of letting go, especially maybe just because I am 55, makes so much more sense than being present to me because uh, it's the same thing. But it allows yeah. you, because what you're saying is, stop it. Let go of whatever you're th perceiving people to see you when they to see when they look at you or how you should be feeling because of the contour of your life. I gave that up a long time ago. You can boo me or you can cheer me. That's up to you. Mm -hmm. Your response is yours. My contribution is mine. When you talk about your ability to not care or try to control what anybody thinks, again, that comes with age. Hmm. Uh, uh, look, there are also old fools, of course. Some people learn <laughs> nothing as they live. Um, and there I, you know, I, I do see them around and that's a tragedy and I, I feel, feel bad for them um, and also um, for the people who have to live with them. But yeah. um, so it's not that all old people are wise. They're not. You know, we do stereotype a lot about people according to their age or whatever. And I don't think that that's true. But if you're open to it, yes, you learn things as you go along. You, you kind of have to if you've got your eyes and ears open at all. For a very, very long time, nobody really worried about getting older. You know, people got older. That's what right. they did. You know, fine, they accepted it. I um, might have loved it, but they accepted it. Then the advertising industry decided that getting older was a bad thing. It's like a disease. Seven signs of aging. You know, you've you, you contracted this ghastly thing and you've got symptoms, for goodness sake, that need to be cured. So here you are. Here's an incredibly expensive cream which will cure them for you. So it's a classic trick. It's a con trick which has been perpetrated on, uh, most effectively, on half the human race. I remember there was a program here about advertising and I used to be a panellist on it for a while. And I said once, and people for many years afterwards see me in the street and repeat this back to me, because I said, if only every woman in the world would wake up one morning and look at herself in the mirror and say, I'm fine just the way I am, entire empires would crumble. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, I just want to get back to the aging thing because I just love everything yeah. you say about it. And is there anything that you talked about in the TED Talks? And I don't want people to compare this to the TED Talk. But like, what was no, your no, most... No. Would, but when you think about that talk, and it was some years ago, it's 2015 that you did that? Yeah, I think so, yeah. If you could add something to that talk now, what would it be? I think... I th oh, yeah, that's a really good question. I think the major thing I take out of ageing is that it is actually an adventure, that it is actually a journey into the unknown. Um, like every other stage in life, it is different from the one you were in before. And oddly enough, we often talk about ourselves as adventurers or explorers, but we're not, we're so frightened of change. We're so frightened of adventure. We're fr so frightened of exploring something that we don't already know. I, I, in fact, I think if I was gonna characterize our society, I'd say that it is a safety and control oriented society. And I agree with you about the pandemic. I sometimes think the pandemic's use Fullness may be that it is teaching us how arrogant we have been Seriously. and how we are not in control. You know, we are subject to the forces of nature. Aging says that to you too. Right. You are subject to the forces of nature. That's like right. every other living thing on this planet. Stop being so arrogant as to think that you're special or different or that somehow you can stay looking gorgeous until you're 95. You yep. can't. And don't stop thinking that because you eat broccoli every day and exercise every day that you will live forever or you can fight your body can somehow fight off diseases that other people's bodies can't what an arrogant point of view no you are just a humble life form carbon-based life form on a planet that That's is it. the truth of it 
It's, and ageing brings you face to face with your ultimate vulnerability. And so it is the great giver of humility. It takes away hubris. You drop the illusion that you are special, that bad things can't happen to you, that, you know, the world revolves around you. You, you, I don't know that you do drop that. You have the opportunity to drop that. What a gift. Why would you walk away from it? Why would you want to pretend that you're not getting older? I, I don't, I don't get it. And that is what I've learned as I've gotten older, that it isn't, I don't need to be better. I don't need to be nicer. I don't need to be thinner. I don't need to be prettier. I don't need to be smarter or nicer or any of those other things. The only point is to be as much myself as I can be with all the shit that I have. Like I've got good bits, bad bits, most of them are both. And if that's what you do, and if that's what we all did, if we were all just as much ourselves as we could be, I think the world would be, I think anxiety would fall through the floor, like we wouldn't just wouldn't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think we'd all have so much closer connections with one another. Mm -hmm. And we'd find so many things easier to deal with because we'd understand, as you said, we never know why someone thinks what they think, how they got to be in the place they're in. Well, if we were so, as much ourselves as we could be and as honest about ourselves and our experiences as we could be, we'd see and all the hatred and muck and tribalism would at least be dented. It might not fall away, but it would at least be dented. So forget the perfection, forget improving, forget trying hard, relax, be yourself. Everything you need, you already have. You just have to believe it. That's yeah. all. Believe in yourself and share every bit of yourself. Like you said, the good bits, the bad bits, the insecure bits, the really Especially the bad bits. bits. Yeah, because I think that that, like it connects us all. And like you said, it would rid us of the anxiety, which is also aging and we don't need it. <laughs> exactly. But the point about the bad bits is people like you for your weaknesses. It's your strengths they can't stand. So when you reveal your weaknesses, you actually attract more people to you. They feel more comfortable with you. They feel they can confide in you because you've told them where you fucked up and did badly and failed and got things wrong. And so they have permission to tell you when they did the same thing. And you know what? Everybody comes out of that conversation feeling better about themselves. Whereas when you go into a conversation and everyone just boasts about how terrific they are and how they've got it all in control and gives you a list of things to follow so that you can control things better than you had in the past, everybody comes out of that conversation feeling worse about themselves. What's the fucking point of it? It's called motivational speaking and it's a crock of shit. It's called smoke and mirrors is what it's called. And it's also called Facebook and Instagram where if none of those filters existed and all of those beautiful women were seen for all of their wrinkles and moles and bad days and the day that they didn't just eat three pieces of broccoli, but they had an ice cream sandwich, then like you said, people would see themselves in them and connect and not be so put off and miserably anxiety ridden as though there was so much to keep up with. The point about perfection too is it's utterly humorless. It is without laughter um, because it's those weaknesses, those flaws, the admitting of them that creates laughter. If I tell a story against myself when I'm making a speech, without exception, the entire room bursts out laughing at the same moment, regardless of demographics or gender or race or anything else at the same moment. And that is because... I'm talking about a human weakness and we can That's all right. identify with it. And so we all connect at that moment over that shared weakness, which is what humour is. Humour is when we reveal our humanity, our essential human selves. I never so set out to be funny. I don't tell punch jokes with punchlines. All I do is tell the truth. And that's so shocking that people laugh. Yeah. And, and they laugh out of connection and surprise. And Pleasure discomfort. And, surprise. and discomfort. And, because well, yeah, mostly it's though it's pleasant surprise because they go, yes, I feel like that, but I never did say. 
that's my point. They, they, they're so uncomfortable, they could never say it out loud. And so at first they're like uncomfortable because they're like, oh my God, is she just talking about me? Did she see me doing that? Then they realize, no, it's totally normal. It's human. Everybody. <laughs> it's hilarious that I thought I was the only one who made that sound when I did that or whatever, you know? <laughs> so, and yeah, there's, there's great joy in sharing your weaknesses with people. And I think if advertising could find a way to make that all acceptable, it might help us with the fear of aging and maybe even the fear of death for some people, I don't know. But like if we could just embrace the imperfection because even perfection, it's, it's, a, it's a quick second and then the wind blows and it's over. You know what I mean? Like there's a, there's a, there's a, a, there's a perfect, not even a full second of time. There are elements of things that have perfection in them, but nothing about it is perfect, right? Mm -mm. So, so like you said, the it's just- The French have always understood this. The French have always understood this. When you go to France and you go into their um, chateaus and things, they're always um, faded and, and um, you know, the, 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 it, it, there's patina on the mirror where they've aged. They understand that it, it is the imperfection, the signs of ageing that actually make that uh, chateau rich with history and with um, the sense of generations of other people having lived in that place. Yeah, I reckon ageing teaches you to embrace imperfection and flaw and um, ugliness and um, aches and pains and difficulty and find the humour in that and through finding the humour and humanity in that, the joy in that. I'm having a better time now at 64 than I've ever had before. And I think, I, I love that. And you know, the idea that, I remember the first time I went to Europe and I touched a building that was so old because I grew up in America, you know? Mm, and yeah, well, Australia the, were the same. Mm. Yeah, and the beauty of a, a, a brick that had been there and seen so much and lasted so long. But I never felt that way when I thought about this face. Of course, it's not thousands of years old, but it's getting there. <laughs> so if I could look at myself like an old building who has a little bit of wine spilled on my feet from the beautiful nights and a little bit of whatever from every joyous moment. And like you said, contour from my life and let go well, of the it, idea of perfection. And, and in a way, you are like the old building. You are thousands of years old. All of us are because we have thousands of, you know, people who, whose genes and DNA have been handed down to us. And one of the things I said in my TED Talk is I'm kind of interested to see how this face is meant to turn out. It won't be pretty, but it will be interesting. And it will also, I'm seeing bits of long past relatives, my grandmothers, for example, my grandfather um, gave me my nose and my glaucoma. Thank you. The nose is good, <laughs> glaucoma not so good. Um, you know, all that kind of thing. My jawline comes from um, my father's side of the family. My jaws from my mother's. I got both bad bits. Um, but my eyes and good bits. Which is my best feature. And good bit. It comes from my mother's family, which is a good bit. So, but I can see my face changing to reflect, to have the kind of a shimmer of my much loved grandmother's face in it, you know, and if you strip all the aging out of it, you'll never see right. that. And the history. that's the patina of the old building. That's your history. That's who, where you came from. It's like, we are all thousand year old bricks. We are the product of generations of people who managed to survive long enough to reproduce and pass on their DNA. And what a miracle that is. And yet Boy. in this era, we want to, Get rid of all that? Why? I, I don't, I, I, I am oddly happier with my face now than I was when I was younger. And I think it's because I, I, I don't admire it. I like it. I love it. I feel comfortable in it. Um, I feel it reflects who I am. I don't have to look at it from the outside in, I look at it from the inside out. 
I can't think of a better way to end this. I mean, honestly, that was beautiful. Just perfection. And I'm sorry to end it like that. But that, but that, Jane, that's perfection. <laughs> Uh, I can't know, think uh, of it. Uh, maybe, maybe the great paradox, maybe the great paradox is you find perfection when you walk away from it. <laughs> when you look at you yourself from it. the inside out. Right. Out. Yeah. Because that's all that matters, who you are, not what you are. No, who you are. That's all that matters. And, that, you know, the body you get around, the, this exterior is just the flesh you get around with in. Yeah. How you interact with the world is much more important than that. Yeah. I, uh, I can't thank you enough for all of that. And I am so inspired by just, by the way you connect words and the, the things that you oh, honestly you. believe and how funny you are and the amount of topics that you are so passionate about and how much <laughs> you know about all of them. And again, I had a crush on you before this, but I have a bigger crush on you now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nikki, thank you. And thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, it's really, I always find these things incredibly useful because it's by talking about things that I also um, clarify what I think. It, it, it's interesting how I sometimes think I'm a verbal thinker. I need, to, I need to get it out of my head and out into the air before I actually start to kind of grasp my own um, perspective on things. So I find this really helpful too. So thank you. Oh, I just, again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just, uh, I, I'm just joy. I'm overjoyed to have had this time with you. Thank you so much. I'm grateful to you for giving me the opportunity. It's wonderful to do. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your day. Speak again, I hope. I hope you so too, too Jane. Mm -hmm.